Welcome to my channel, The Game of Life and How to Play It, an audiobook by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 1 The Game. Most people regard life as a battle, but it is not a battle, it is a game. It is a game, however, that cannot be played successfully without the knowledge of spiritual law, and the Old and New Testaments give the rules of the game with wonderful clarity. Jesus Christ taught that it was a great game of give and take. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This means that whatever a man sends out in word or deed will come back to him. Whatever he gives, he will receive. If he gives hatred, he will receive hatred. If he gives love, he will receive love. If he gives criticism, he will receive criticism. If he lies, he will be lied to. If he deceives, he will be deceived. We are taught also that the faculty of imagination plays a major role in the game of life. Keep thy heart, or imagination, with all diligence, for out of it proceed the issues of life. This means that what a man imagines he sooner or later externally sees in his affairs. I know of a man who feared a certain disease. It was a very rare and difficult disease to contract, but he imagined it continually and read about it until it manifested itself in his body, and he died, a victim of distorted imagination. So we see, to successfully play the game of life, we must train the faculty of imagination. A person with an imaginative faculty trained to imagine only the good brings into his life every righteous desire of his heart. Health, wealth, love, friends, perfect self-expression, his highest ideals. Imagination has been called the scissors of the mind, and it is always cutting, cutting day by day, the images that man sees there, and sooner or later he meets his own creations in his outer world. To train the imagination successfully, man must understand the workings of his mind. The Greek said, know thyself. There are three departments of the mind, the subconscious, the conscious, and the superconscious. The subconscious is simply power, without direction. It is like steam or electricity, and does what it is directed to do. It has no power of induction. Whatever a man feels deeply or imagines clearly is impressed upon the subconscious mind and is carried out in the minutest detail. For example, a woman I know when she was a child always made believe she was a widow. She dressed in black clothes and wore a long black veil, and people thought she was very smart and funny. She grew up and married a man with whom she was deeply in love. Soon after he died and she wore black and a wide veil for many years, the image of herself as a widow was imprinted on the subconscious mind and in due course resolved itself despite the havoc created. The conscious mind has been called the mortal or carnal mind. It is the human mind and sees life as it appears to be. It sees death, disaster, disease, poverty, and limitations of all kinds and impresses the subconscious. The superconscious mind is the mind of God within every man and is the realm of perfect ideas. In it is found the perfect pattern spoken of by Plato, the divine design, for there is a divine design for each person. There is a place you must fill that no one else can fill, something you must do that no one else can do. There is a perfect picture of this in the superconscious mind. It usually passes through the conscious as an unattainable ideal, something too good to be true. In reality, it is the true destiny of man, shown to him from the infinite intelligence within him. Many people, however, ignore their true destiny and strive to achieve things and situations which do not belong to them and which, if achieved, would only bring them failure and dissatisfaction. For example, a woman came to see me and asked me to say the word that she would marry a certain man she was very much in love with. She called him A.B. I replied that this would be a violation of spiritual law, but that I would speak the word for the right man, the divine selection, the man who belonged to her by divine right. I added, if A.B. is the right man, you cannot lose him, and if he is not, you will receive his equivalent. She saw A.B. frequently, but made no progress in their friendship. One night she called me and said, You know, for the past week, A.B. hasn't seemed so wonderful to me. I replied, Maybe he is not the divine selection, 
another man may be the right one. Shortly thereafter, she met another man who fell in love with her instantly, and who said he was her ideal. In fact, he told her all the things she had always wished A had told her. B, she remarked, it was rather strange. She soon reciprocated his love and lost all interest in A.B. This demonstrates the law of substitution. A right idea was substituted for a wrong one, so there was no loss and no sacrifice. Jesus Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And he said that the kingdom was within man. The kingdom is the realm of right ideas or the divine pattern. Jesus Christ taught that man's words played a major role in the game of life. By your words you are justified, and by your words you are condemned. Many people have brought disaster into their lives by idle words. For example, a woman once asked me why her life was now a poverty of limitations. She used to have a house, was surrounded by beautiful things, and had plenty of money. We discovered that she had often grown tired of the management of her house, and had repeatedly said, I am sick of things, I wish I lived in a trunk, and she added, Today I am living in that trunk. She had put herself in a trunk. The subconscious mind has no sense of humor, and people often joke about their unhappy experiences. For example, a woman who had a lot of money continually joked about getting ready for the poorhouse. In a few years she was almost destitute, having impressed the subconscious mind with an image of lack and limitation. Fortunately, the law works both ways, and a situation of lack can be changed to one of abundance. For example, a woman came to me one hot summer day for a prosperity treatment. She was exhausted, dejected, and discouraged. She said she had only eight dollars in the world. I said, well, we will bless the eight dollars and multiply it as Jesus Christ multiplied the loaves and fishes, for he taught that every man had the power to bless and multiply, to heal and prosper. She said, what shall I do now? I replied, follow the intuition. Do you have a hunch to do something or to go somewhere? Intuition means intuition or being taught from within. It is man's infallible guide and I will deal more fully with its laws in a following chapter. The woman replied, I don't know. I seem to have a hunch to go home. I have just enough money for the car ride. Her home was in a distant city and was one of lack and limitation and the reasoning mind or intellect would have said, stay in New York and get a job and earn some money. I replied, then go home, never violate a hunch. I said the following words to him, the infinite spirit opens the way of great abundance for, it is an irresistible magnet for all that belongs to it by divine right. I told her to repeat it also continuously. She went home immediately. Calling a woman one day, she connected with an old friend of her family. Through this friend, she received thousands of dollars in the most miraculous way. She has often told me, tell people about the woman who came to you with eight dollars and a hunch. There is always abundance in the way of man, but it can only be brought into manifestation through desire, faith, or the spoken word. Jesus Christ made it manifest that man must take the first step. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In the scriptures we read, As for the works of my hands, command ye me. The infinite intelligence God is always ready to carry out the smallest or the greatest demands of man. Every desire expressed or unexpressed is a demand. We are often startled to see a desire suddenly fulfilled. For example, one Easter, having seen many beautiful rose bushes in the windows of the flower shops, I wished to receive one, and for an instant I saw it being carried mentally to the door. Easter came, and with it a beautiful rose bush. The next day I thanked my friend and told her it was just what I wanted. She replied, I didn't send you a rose bush, I sent you lilies. The man had mixed up the order and sent me a rose bush simply because I had set the law in motion, and I had to have a rose bush. Nothing stands between man and his highest ideals and all the desires of his heart, but doubt and fear. When man can desire without worry, every desire will be instantly fulfilled. In a following chapter, I will explain in more detail the scientific reason for this and how fear must be erased from consciousness. It is the only enemy of man, the fear of lack, the fear of failure, the fear of disease, the fear of loss, and the feeling of insecurity on some plane. Jesus Christ said, Why are you afraid? 
O ye of little faith. So we can see that we must replace fear with faith because fear is only an inverted faith. It is faith in evil instead of good. The object of the game of life is to see clearly one's own good and to erase all mental images of evil. This must be done by impressing the subconscious mind with the realization of good. A very brilliant man, who has achieved great success, told me that he had suddenly erased all fear from his consciousness by reading a poster hanging in a room. He saw printed in large letters this statement, Why worry? It will probably never happen. These words were indelibly engraved in his subconscious, and now he has the firm conviction that only good can come into his life. Therefore, only good can manifest itself. In the next chapter, I will deal with the different methods of impressing the subconscious mind. It is the faithful servant of man, but care must be taken to give it the right orders. Man has always a silent listener at his side, his subconscious mind. Every thought, every word is impressed upon it and carried out in astonishing detail. He is like a singer recording on the sensitive disc of the phonograph plate. Every note and pitch of the singer's voice is recorded. If he coughs or hesitates, it is also recorded. So let us break all the old and bad records in the subconscious mind, the records of our lives that we do not wish to keep, and make new and beautiful ones. Say these words aloud, with power and conviction. I now crush and demolish, with my word, every false record in my subconscious mind. They will return to the dust heap of their native nothingness, for they came from my own vine imaginings. I now make my records perfect through the Christ within, the records of health, wealth, love and perfect self-expression. This is the square of life, the completed game. In the following chapters, I will show how man can change his conditions by changing his words. Any man who does not know the power of the word is backward. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Chapter 2 the law of prosperity. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have silver in abundance. One of the greatest messages given to the race through the scriptures is that God is man's supply, and that man can release, through his spoken word, all that belongs to him by divine right. He must, however, have perfect faith in his spoken word. Isaiah said, My word shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that to which it is sent. We know now, that words and thoughts are a tremendous vibratory force ever shaping the body and affairs of man. A woman came to me in great distress and said she was going to be sued on the day of the month for $3,000. She did not know how to get the money and was desperate. I told her that God was her supply and there is a supply for every demand. So I said the word. I gave thanks that the woman would receive $3,000 at the right time and in the right way. I told her that she must have perfect faith and act out her perfect faith. The day came, but the money had not materialized. She called me on the phone and asked me what she should do. I replied, It's Saturday, so you won't be sued today. Your part is to act richly, thus showing perfect faith that you will receive it on Monday. She asked me to have lunch with her to build up her courage. When I met her at a restaurant, I told her, This is no time to economize. Order an expensive lunch, act as if you have already received the $3,000. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believing, you will receive. You must act as if you have already received. The next morning she called me on the phone and asked me to stay with her for the day. I told her, no, you are divinely protected and God is never too late. In the evening she phoned again, very excited and said, my dear, a miracle has happened. I was sitting in my room this morning when the doorbell rang. I said to the maid, don't let anyone in. The maid, however, looked out the window and said, it's your cousin with the long white beard. So I said, call him in, I'd like to see him. He was turning the corner when he heard the maid's voice and he came back. He talked for an hour and just as he was leaving, he said to me, by the way, how are the finances? I told him I needed the money and he said, well, my dear, I'll give you $3,000 on the first of the month. I didn't like to tell him I was going to be sued. What am I going to do? I won't get it until the first of the month and I must have it tomorrow. I said, I'll keep on trying. I said, the spirit is never too late. I am thankful that I received the money on the invisible plane and that it manifested in time. The next morning her cousin called her and said, come to my office this morning and I will give you the money. That afternoon she had $3,000 to her credit at the bank 
and she wrote checks as fast as her excitement would allow. If one asks for success and prepares for failure, he will get the situation for which he has prepared. For example, a man came to me asking me to say the word that a certain debt would be cancelled. I realized that he spent his time planning what he would say to the man when he failed to pay his bill, thus neutralizing my words. He should have seen himself paying the debt. We have a wonderful illustration of this in the Bible, relating to the three kings who were in the desert, without water for their men and horses. They consulted the prophet Elisha, who gave them this amazing message, Thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, but make this valley full of ditches. Man must prepare for what he has asked for, when there is not the slightest sign of it in sight. E.g. A woman found it necessary to look for an apartment during the year when there was a great shortage of apartments in New York. It was considered almost an impossibility, and her friends felt sorry for her and said, Too bad, you'll have to keep your furniture and live in a hotel. She replied, You need not feel sorry for me. I am a superman, and I will get an apartment. She uttered the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for the right apartment. She knew that there was a supply for every demand, and that she was unconditioned, working on the spiritual plane, and that one with God is most. She had contemplated buying new blankets when the tempter, the adverse thought or reasoning mind, suggested to her, Don't buy the blankets, maybe. After all, you won't get an apartment, and they won't fit. She quickly replied to herself, I'll dig my ditches by buying the blankets. So she prepared for the apartment. She acted as if she already had one. She miraculously found one, and they gave it to her, even though there were over 200 other applicants. The blankets showed active faith. Needless to say, the ditches dug by the three kings in the desert were filled to overflowing. Read, Twi Kings. Getting into the spiritual rhythm is not easy for the common person. Adverse thoughts of doubt and fear arise from the subconscious. They are the army of aliens that must be put to flight. This explains why it is often darkest before the dawn. A great demonstration is often preceded by tormenting thoughts. Having made a statement of high spiritual truth, one challenges old beliefs in the subconscious, and the error is exposed to be extinguished. This is the time when one should make one's affirmations of truth repeatedly, and rejoice and give thanks for having already received. Before you call, I will answer you. This means that every good and perfect gift is already man's awaiting his acknowledgement. Man can only receive what he sees himself receiving. The children of Israel were told that they could have all the land they could see. This is true of every man. He only has the land within his own mental vision. Every great work, every great achievement, has been manifested through holding the vision and often just before the great achievement comes apparent failure and discouragement. The children of Israel, when they came to the promised land, they were afraid to enter, because they said it was full of giants who made them feel like grasshoppers. And there we saw the giants, and we felt like grasshoppers. This is the experience of almost every man. He, however, who knows the spiritual law is not disturbed by the appearance, and rejoices while he is yet in bondage. That is, he holds fast to his vision and gives thanks because the end is fulfilled, he has received. Jesus Christ gave a wonderful example of this. He said to his disciples, Do you not say that there are still four months before the harvest comes? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are ripe for harvest. His clear vision pierced the world of matter, and he saw clearly the world of the fourth dimension, things as they really are perfect and complete in the divine mind. So man must always keep the vision of the end of his journey and demand the manifestation of what he has already received. It may be his perfect health, love, supply, self-expression, home, or friends. All are finished and perfect ideas recorded in the divine mind, man's own superconscious mind, and must come through him, not to him. For example, a man came to me asking for treatments for success, it was imperative that he raise by a certain deadline $50,000 for his business. The deadline was about to pass when he came to me in desperation. No one wanted to invest in his business, and the bank had flatly refused him a loan. I replied, I guess you lost your nerve while you were at the bank, therefore your power. You can control any situation if you first control yourself. Go back to the bank, I added, 
and I will treat you. My treatment was, you identify yourself in love with the spirit of everyone connected with the bank. Let the divine idea come out of this situation. She replied, woman, you are talking about an impossibility. Tomorrow is Saturday, the bank closes at 12 o'clock, and my train won't take me until 10 o'clock, and the deadline is tomorrow, and they won't do it anyway. It is too late, I replied. God doesn't need time and it's never too late. With him, everything is possible. And I added, I know nothing about business, but I know everything about God. He replied, everything sounds good when I sit here and listen to you, but when I go out, it is terrible. He lived in a distant city and I didn't hear from him for a week. Then a letter came. It said, you were right. I got the money and I will never again doubt the truth of everything you told me. I saw him a few weeks later and said, what happened? You evidently had plenty of time after all. He replied, my train was late and I arrived at 15 minutes to 12. I walked into the bank quietly and said, I've come for the loan and they gave it to me without complaint. It was the last 15 minutes of the time allotted to him and the infinite spirit was not too late. In this case, the man could not have manifested alone. He needed someone to help him maintain the vision. This is what one man can do for another. Jesus Christ knew the truth of this when he said, If two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. One gets too close to one's own affairs and becomes doubtful and fearful. The friend or healer clearly sees success, health or prosperity and never wavers because he is not close to the situation. It is much easier to prove to another person than to oneself so a person should not hesitate to ask for help if he feels hesitant. A keen observer of life once said, no man can fail if a person sees him succeed. Such is the power of vision, and many a great man has owed his success to a wife or a sister or a friend who believed in him and stood unhesitatingly in the perfect pattern. Chapter 3. The Power of the Word by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. A person who knows the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. He has only to observe the reaction of his words to know that they do not return empty. Through his spoken word man is continually making laws for himself. I knew a man who said, I always lose a car. It invariably leaves just when I arrive. His daughter would say, I always catch a car. It's sure to come right when I arrive. This went on for years, each had made a different law for himself, one of failure, one of success. This is the psychology of superstitions. The horse's shoe or rabbit's foot contains no power, but the man's word and belief that it will bring him good luck creates expectation in the subconscious mind and attracts a lucky situation. However, I find that this does not work when man has advanced spiritually and knows a higher law. One cannot go back and must put away the sculpted images. For example, two men in my class had been very successful in business for several months when suddenly everything went down the drain. We tried to analyze the situation and I discovered that instead of making their affirmations and looking to God for success and prosperity, each had bought a lucky monkey. I said to them, Oh, I see, you have been relying on the lucky monkeys instead of God. Drop the lucky monkeys and invoke the law of forgiveness for man has the power to forgive or neutralize his mistakes. They decided to throw the lucky monkeys down a coal pit and everything went well again. This does not mean, however, that one should throw away all the lucky ornaments or horseshoes in the house, but that one should recognize that the power behind it is the only power God and that the object simply gives one a feeling of expectation. One day I was with a friend who was very desperate. As she crossed the street, she picked up a horseshoe Immediately she was filled with joy and hope. She said that God had sent her the horseshoe to keep her courage. In fact, at that moment it was the only thing that could have registered on his conscience. His hope turned to faith, and in the end, he made a wonderful demonstration. I want to make it clear that the men mentioned above depended on the monkeys alone, while this woman recognized the power of the horse issue. I know that, in my own case, it took me a long time to get out of the belief that a certain thing brought disappointment. If the thing happened, disappointment invariably followed. I found that the only way to make a change in the subconscious was to affirm, there are not two powers, there is only one power, God. Therefore, there are no disappointments. 
and this thing means a happy surprise. Right away I noticed a change, and happy surprises began to come to me. I have a friend who said that nothing could induce her to walk under a ladder. I said to her, if you are afraid you are yielding to a belief in two powers, good and evil, instead of one. As God is absolute, there can be no opposing power unless man makes the counterfeit of evil for himself. To prove that you believe in one power God, and that there is no power or reality in evil, go under the next ladder you see. Soon after, he went to his bank. He wanted to open his box in the safe, and in his way was a ladder. It was impossible to get to the box without going under the ladder. He trembled with fear and turned around. He could not face the lion in his path. However, when he reached the street, my words echoed in his ears, and he decided to turn back and go under. It was a great moment in her life, as the stairs had kept her enslaved for years. She retraced her steps back to the vault, and the ladder was no longer there. This happens all too often. If you are willing to do something you are afraid of, you don't have to do it. It is the law of non-resistance which is so little understood. Someone has said that courage contains genius and magic. Face a situation without fear, and there is no situation to face. It falls of its own weight. The explanation is that fear drew the ladder in the woman's path, and fearlessness removed it. Thus, the invisible forces are always working for the man, who is always pulling the strings himself, even if he does not know it. Due to the vibrational power of words, everything that man expresses begins to be attracted. People who continually talk about the disease invariably attract it. Once a man knows the truth, he cannot be too careful with his words. For example, I have a friend who often says over the phone, come see me and let's have a good old-fashioned talk. This old-fashioned talk means an hour of 500 to 1,000 destructive words, the main themes of which are loss, lack, failure, and illness. I reply, no, I appreciate it. I've had enough old-fashioned talk in my life, it's too expensive, but I'd be happy to have a new-fashioned talk and talk about what we want, not what we don't want. There is an old saying that man only dares to use his words for three purposes, to heal, bless, or prosper. What man says of others will be said of him, and what he wishes for another he is wishing for himself. Curses like chickens come home to roost. If a man wishes someone bad luck, he is sure to attract bad luck himself. If he wishes to help someone to succeed, he is wishing and helping himself to succeed. The body can be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease can be completely eliminated from consciousness. The metaphysician knows that every disease has a mental correspondence, and to cure the body one must cure the soul. The soul is the subconscious mind, and must be savoured from erroneous thinking. In the 23rd Psalm, we read, He restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind, or soul, must be restored with right ideas, and the mystical marriage is the marriage of soul and spirit, or the subconscious and superconscious mind. They must be one. When the subconscious is flooded with the perfect ideas of the superconscious, God and man are one, I and the Father are one. That is, man is one with the realm of perfect ideas. He is man made in the likeness and image of God, imagination, and is given power and dominion over all created things, his mind, his body, and his affairs. It may be said that all sickness and unhappiness come from the violation of the law of love. A new commandment I give you, love one another. And in the game of life, love or goodwill takes all the trumps. For example, a woman I know had for years an appearance of a terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable and she was desperate. She was on the stage and feared she would soon have to give up her profession and had no other means of livelihood. However, she got a good contract and on opening night she had a great hit. She received praise from the critics and felt happy and elated. The next day she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast was jealous of her success and had caused her dismissal. She felt hatred and resentment completely take hold of her and she cried out, Oh God, don't let me hate that man. That night she worked for hours in the silence. She said, Soon I went into a very deep silence. I seemed to be at peace with myself, with the man and with the whole world. I continued in this way for the next two nights, and on the third day 
I found that I was completely cured of the skin disease. By asking for love or goodwill, I had fulfilled the law, for love is the fulfillment of the law, and the disease, which stemmed from subconscious resentment, was eliminated. Continuous criticism produces rheumatism, as critical and inharmonious thoughts provoke unnatural deposits in the blood, which settle in the joints. Jealousy, hatred, unforgiveness, fear, etc., cause false growths. All disease is caused by a mind that is not at ease. I once said in my class, it is useless to ask someone, what is wrong with you? We might as well say, who is wrong with you? Unforgiveness is the most prolific cause of disease. It hardens the arteries or the liver and affects the eyesight. In its train are a host of ills. One day I visited a woman who told me she was ill from eating a poisoned oyster. I replied, oh no, the oyster was harmless. You poisoned it. What's the matter with you? She replied, oh, about 19 people. She had fought with 19 people and had become so inharmonious that she attracted the wrong oyster. Any inharmony in the external indicates that there is mental inharmony. As the inside, so the outside. Man's only enemies are within himself, and man's enemies will be those in his own house. Personality is one of the last enemies to be overcome, as this planet is taking its initiation into love. It was Christ's message, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. The enlightened man therefore strives to perfect himself in his fellow man. His work is with himself, to send goodwill and blessings to every man, and the wonderful thing is that if one blesses a man, he has no power to harm him. For example, a man came to me asking me to treat him for success in business. He was selling machinery, and a rival appeared on the scene with what he proclaimed was a better machine, and my friend feared defeat. I told him, first of all, you have to eliminate all fear and know that God protects your interests and that the divine idea must come out of the situation. That is, the right machine will be sold by the right man to the right man. And I added, don't have a single critical thought toward that man. Bless him all day long and be willing not to sell your machine if it is not the divine idea. So he went to the meeting without fear and without resistance and blessing the other man. He said the result was quite remarkable. The other man's machine refused to work, and he sold his without the least difficulty. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who mistreat and persecute you. Goodwill produces a great aura of protection around the one who sends it, and no weapon formed against him shall prosper. In other words, love and goodwill destroy enemies within oneself, so that one has no enemies without. There is peace on earth to him who sends goodwill to man. Chapter 4. The Law of Non-Resistance Resist not evil. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sweep everything before it. Jesus Christ said, Resist not evil, because he knew that in reality there is no evil, therefore nothing to resist. Evil has come from man's vain imagination, or belief in two powers, good and evil. There is an ancient legend that Adam and Eve ate of Maya the tree of illusion, and saw two powers instead of one power, God. Therefore, evil is a false law that man has made for himself, through the psychoma or soul dream. Soul sleep means that the soul of man has been hypnotized by the belief of the race, of sin, sickness and death, etc., which is carnal or mortal thought, and its affairs have overcome its illusions. We have read in a previous chapter that the soul of man is his subconscious mind, and all that he feels deeply, good or bad, is externalized by that faithful servant. His body and affairs show what he has been imagining. The sick man has represented sickness, the poor man, poverty, the rich man, wealth. People often say, why does a little child attract sickness when he is too young even to know what it means? I answer that children are sensitive and receptive to the thoughts of others about them and often externalize their parents' fears. I once heard a metaphysician say, if you don't direct your subconscious yourself, someone else will do it for you. Mothers often unconsciously attract illness and disaster to their children, continually keeping them in fearful thoughts and watching for symptoms. For example, 
A friend asked a woman if her little girl had had measles. She quickly replied, not yet. This implied that she was waiting for the disease and thus paving the way for what she did not want for herself and her child. However, the man who is centered and established in right thinking, the man who sends only goodwill to his fellow man and who is not afraid, cannot be touched or influenced by the negative thoughts of others. In fact, he could then receive only good thoughts, since he himself sends only good thoughts. Resistance is hell, for it places man in a state of torment. A metaphysician once gave me a wonderful recipe for taking all the tricks in the game of life. It is the height of non-resistance. He gave it this way. At one time in my life I baptized children, and of course they had many names. Now I no longer baptize children, but baptize events. But I give each event the same name. If I have a failure, I baptize it successfully, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this we see the great law of transmutation founded on non-resistance. Through his word, every failure was transmuted into success. For example, a woman who needed money and who knew the spiritual law of opulence was continually in business with a man who made her feel very poor. He spoke of lack and limitations and she began to catch his thoughts of poverty, so she disliked him and blamed him for her failure. She knew that to demonstrate her supply, she had to first feel that she had received, a feeling of opulence had to precede its manifestation. One day she realized that she was resisting the situation and seeing two powers instead of one. So he blessed the man and christened the situation success. He stated, Since there is only one power, God, this man is here for my good and prosperity. Just what he didn't seem to be here for. Shortly thereafter he met through this man, a woman who gave him for a service rendered several thousand dollars, and the man moved to a distant city and vanished harmoniously from his life. He states, Every man is a golden link in the chain of my good, for all men are God in manifestation, waiting for the opportunity that man himself gives him to serve the divine plan of his life. Bless thine enemy, and thou shalt rob him of his ammunition. His arrows will be transmuted into blessings, this law is valid for nations as well as for individuals. Bless a nation, send love and goodwill to each of its inhabitants, and it is robbed of its power to harm. Man can only get the right idea of non-resistance through spiritual understanding. My students have often said, I don't want to be a doormat. I reply, when you use non-resistance wisely, no one will be able to get past you. Another example, one day I was impatiently waiting for an important phone call. I resisted all incoming calls and did not make any outgoing calls, reasoning that it might interfere with the one I was waiting for. Instead of saying, divine ideas never conflict, the call will come at the right time. Letting infinite intelligence take care of it, I began to handle things myself. I made the battle my own, not God's, and remained tense and anxious. The ringer didn't ring for about an hour, and upon looking at the phone I discovered that the receiver had been off during that time and the phone was disconnected. My anxiety, fear, and belief in interference had caused a total eclipse of the phone. Realizing what I had done, I immediately began to bless the situation. I christened it success and affirmed, I cannot miss any call that belongs to me by divine right. I am under grace and not under law. A friend rushed out to the nearest telephone to alert the company and reconnect. He entered a crowded grocery store but the owner left his customers and took the call himself. My phone connected immediately, and two minutes later, I received a very important call, and about an hour later the one I had been waiting for. One's ships come in on a calm sea. As long as a man resists a situation, he will have it with him. If he runs away from it, it will run after him. E.G. One day I repeated this to a woman, and she replied, How true it is! I was unhappy at home. I disliked my mother who was critical and domineering, so I ran away and married. But I married my mother because my husband was exactly like my mother, and I had to face the same situation again. Agree with your adversary quickly. That means agree that the adverse situation is good, don't get upset about it, and it falls of its own weight. None of these things move me, is a wonderful statement. The inharmonious situation comes from some inharmony within the man himself. When there is, in him, no emotional response to an inharmonious situation, it vanishes forever from his path.
So we see that man's work is always with himself. People have said to me, give treatments to change my husband or my brother. I answer, no, I will give treatments to change you. When you change, your husband and your brother will change. One of my students had a habit of lying. I told her that it was a failed method and that if she lied, she would be lied to. She replied, I don't care. I can't get by without lying. One day I was talking on the phone with a man I was very much in love with. He turned to me and said, I don't trust him. I know he lies to me. I replied, well, you lie yourself, so someone has to lie to you, and it's bound to be just the person you want the truth from. Sometime later I saw her and she said, I'm cured of lying. I asked her, what has cured you? She replied, I have been living with a woman who lied worse than I did. One is often cured of one's faults by seeing them in others. Life is a mirror, and we only find ourselves reflected in our associates. Living in the past is a method of failure and a violation of spiritual law. Jesus Christ said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. The thieves of time are the past and the future. Man must bless the past and forget it if it keeps him in bondage and bless the future, knowing that it has infinite joys in store for him but live fully in the now. For example, a woman came to see me, complaining that she had no money to buy Christmas presents. She said to me, Last year it was very different. I had a lot of money and made beautiful gifts and this year I barely have a penny. I replied, You will never show that you have money as long as you are pathetic and live in the past. Live fully in the now and get ready to give Christmas presents. Dig your ditches and the money will come. She exclaimed, I know what to do. I'll buy tinsel twine, Christmas stamps and wrapping paper. I replied, You do that, and the presents will come and stick to the Christmas stamps. This also showed financial fearlessness and faith in God, as the reasoning mind said, Save every penny you have, as you are not sure you will receive more. He bought the stamps, paper and string, and a few days before Christmas received a gift of several hundred dollars. The purchase of the stamps and string had impressed the subconscious with expectation and opened the way for the manifestation of the money. He bought all the gifts in plenty of time. Man must live suspended in the moment. Look well then, upon this day. Such is the greeting of the dawn. He must be spiritually alert, always watching for his clues, seizing every opportunity. One day I said continuously, silently, Infinite Spirit, let me not miss a trick. And something very important was said to me that night. It is very necessary to begin the day with right words. Make an affirmation immediately upon awakening. For example, Thy will be done today. Today is a day of fullness. I give thanks for this perfect day. Miracle will follow miracle, and wonders will never cease. Make this a habit and one will see wonders and miracles come into one's life. One morning I picked up a book and read, Look with wonder at what is before you. It seemed to be my message for the day, so I repeated over and over again, Look with wonder at what is before you. Around noon I was handed a large sum of money, which I had been desiring for a certain purpose. In a following chapter, I will give the affirmations that I have found most effective. However, one should never use an affirmation unless it is absolutely satisfactory and convincing to one's own consciousness, and often an affirmation is changed to suit different people. For example, the following has brought success to many. I have a wonderful job in a wonderful way. I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. I gave the first two lines to one of my students, and she added the last two. It was a powerful phrase, as there should always be perfect pay for perfect service, and a rhyme sinks easily into the subconscious. She began to sing it aloud, and soon received a wonderful job in a wonderful way, and rendered a wonderful service for a wonderful pay. Another student, a businessman, took it and changed the word job to business. He repeated, I have a wonderful business, in a wonderful way, and I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. That afternoon he did $41,000 worth of business, Although there had been no activity in his affairs for months, each statement should be carefully worded and cover the ground completely. For example, I met a woman who was in great need and she made a demand for work. She received a great deal of work but was never paid anything. Now she knows how to add, wonderful service for wonderful pay. Man has a divine right to have plenty, 
more than enough. His barns must be full, and his cup runneth over. This is God's idea for man, and when man breaks down the barriers of lack in his own consciousness, the golden age will be his, and every righteous desire of his heart will be fulfilled. Chapter 5 The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness Man receives only what he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words come back to him sooner or later with astonishing precision. This is the law of karma, which in Sanskrit means return. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For example, a friend told me this story about herself, which illustrates the law. She told me, I make all my karma about my aunt. Everything I say to her, someone says to me, I am often irritable at home and one day I said to my aunt who was talking to me during dinner, let's not talk anymore, I want to eat in peace. The next day, I was eating with a woman with whom I wished to make a great impression. I was talking animatedly when she said, no more talk, I wish to eat in peace. My friend is high in consciousness, so her karma returns much more quickly than to one on the mental plane. The more a man knows, the more responsible he is, and a person with knowledge of the spiritual law who does not practice suffers greatly accordingly. The fear of the Lord, law, is the beginning of wisdom. If we read the word Lord, law, it will make many passages in the Bible much clearer. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, law. It is the law that takes vengeance, not God. God sees man perfect, created in his image and likeness, imagination, and gives him power and dominion. This is the perfect idea of man, recorded in the divine mind, awaiting man's recognition. For man can only be what he sees he is, and can only attain what he sees he attains. Nothing happens without an observer is an old saying. Man first sees his failure or his success, his joy or his sorrow, before it becomes visible from the scenes that have been set up in his own imagination. We have observed it in the mother who imagines the sickness of her child, or in the wife who sees the success of her husband. Jesus Christ said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Thus, we see that freedom, from all unhappy conditions, comes through knowledge, a knowledge of the spiritual law. Obedience precedes authority, and the law obeys man when he obeys the law. The law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes man's servant. When ignorantly handled, it becomes man's mortal enemy. The same is true of the laws of the mind. For example, a woman with a strong personal will wished to own a house that belonged to an acquaintance and often imagined herself living in the house. Eventually the man died and she moved into the house. Several years later, upon learning about spiritual law, she said to me, Do you think I had something to do with that man's death? I replied, Yes, your desire was so strong that everything came your way, but you paid your karmic debt. Your husband, whom you loved devotedly, died soon after, and the house was a white elephant in your hands for years. The original owner, however, could not have been affected by her thoughts if she had been positive in truth, nor her husband, but both were under karmic law. The woman should have said, feeling the great desire for the house, Infinite intelligence, give me the right house equally lovely as this, the house that is mine by divine right. The divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all. The divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work from. Desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. In demonstrating, the most important step is the first, asking rightly. Man must always demand only what is rightfully his by divine right. Returning to the illustration, if the woman had taken this attitude, if this house which I desire is mine, I cannot lose it. If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man could have decided to move out harmoniously, if it had been the divine selection for her, or would have been replaced by another house. Anything forced to manifest through personal will is always spoiled and has always bad success. Man is admonished, my will be done, not yours. And the curious thing is that man always gets just what he desires when he gives up personal will, thus allowing infinite intelligence to work through him. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, law. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. 
Her daughter had decided to go on a very dangerous journey, and the mother was filled with fear. She said that she had used every argument, had pointed out to her the dangers she would encounter, and had forbidden her to go. But the daughter was becoming more and more rebellious and determined. I said to the mother, You are imposing your personal will on your daughter, which you have no right to do, and your fear of the journey is only attracting it, for man attracts what he fears. And I added, Let go and take your mental hands off, put it in God's hands, and use this affirmation, I place this situation in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist, but if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks that it now dissolves and dissipates. A day or two later, her daughter told her, Mother, I have given up the trip, and the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to be still, which seems so difficult for man. I will deal more fully with this law in the chapter on non-resistance. I will give another example of sowing and reaping, which occurred in the most curious way. A woman came to tell me that she had received a counterfeit $20 bill, which had been given her at the bank. She was very worried, because she said, the people at the bank will never recognize their mistake. I replied, let's analyze the situation and find out why she attracted it. She thought for a few moments and exclaimed, I know, I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So the law had sent her stage money, for she knows nothing about jokes. I said, now we will invoke the law of forgiveness and we will neutralize the situation. Christianity is based on the law of forgiveness. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the karmic law, and the Christ within every man is his Redeemer and his salvation from all inharmonious conditions. So I said, Infinite Spirit, we invoke the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law, and cannot lose this twenty dollars, which is hers by divine right. Now, I said to her, go back to the bank and tell them, without fear, that they have given it to you there by mistake. She obeyed and to her surprise they apologized and gave her another bill, treating her very politely. So the knowledge of the law gives man the power to erase his mistakes. Man cannot force the external to be what it is not. If he desires riches, he must first be rich in conscience. For example, a woman came to me asking for treatment for prosperity. She was not much interested in the affairs of her home and her house was in great disorder. I told her, if you want to be rich, you must be tidy. All men of great wealth are orderly, and order is the first law of heaven. And I added, you will never get rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor, and immediately began to put her house in order. She rearranged the furniture, tidied the table drawers, cleaned the carpets, and soon made a big financial showing, a gift from a relative. The woman, for her part, tidied up and keeps herself in financial shape, always being attentive to externals and expecting prosperity, knowing that God is her supply. Many people are ignorant that gifts and things are investments, and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss. There are those who scatter and yet increase, and there are those who withhold more than is due, but tend to poverty. For example, I knew a man who wanted to buy a fur coat, he and his wife went to several stores, but there were none that he wanted. He said they were all too cheap. Finally, he was shown one which the salesman said was valued at a thousand dollars, but which the manager would sell him for five hundred dollars as it was late in the season. His financial possessions amounted to about seven hundred dollars. The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend almost all you have on a coat. But he was very intuitive and never reasoned. He turned to his wife and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a lot of money. So his wife consented weakly. A month later, he received a commission of $10,000. The coat made him feel very rich, connected him with success and prosperity. Without the coat, he would not have received the commission. It was an investment that paid him great dividends. If the man ignores these directions for spending or giving, the same amount of money will go an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me that on Thanksgiving Day, she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money but decided to save it. A few days later, someone came into her room and pulled out of the dresser drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost. The law always supports the man who spends fearlessly, wisely. For example, 
One of my students was shopping with her little nephew. The child was clamoring for a toy, which she told him she could not buy. She suddenly realized that she was looking for the lack and not recognizing God as her supply. So she bought the toy and, on her way home, picked up on the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it. Man's supply is inexhaustible and infallible when fully trusted, but faith or trust must precede demonstration. According to your faith be it unto you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For faith holds fast the vision, and adverse images dissolve and dissipate, and in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Jesus Christ brought the good news, the gospel, that there was a higher law than the law of karma, and that this law transcends the law of karma. It is the law of grace or forgiveness. It is the law that frees man from the law of cause and effect, the law of consequences, under grace and not under law. We are told that on this plane man reaps where he has not sown. The gifts of God are simply poured out upon him, all that the kingdom offers is his. This continued state of bliss awaits the man who has outgrown the thought of the race or the world. In the thought of the world there is tribulation, but Jesus Christ said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The thought of the world is that of sin, sickness, and death. He saw its utter unreality and said that sickness and pain will pass away, and death itself the last enemy will be overcome. We know now from a scientific point of view that death could be conquered by impressing upon the subconscious mind the conviction of eternal youth and everlasting life. The subconscious being simply power without direction carries out orders without question. Working under the direction of the superconscious, the Christ or God within man, the resurrection of the body would be achieved. Man would no longer shed his body at death, he would be transformed into the electric body, sung by Walt Whitman. For Christianity is founded on the forgiveness of sins and an empty tomb. Chapter 6. Casting the Load. Impressing the Subconscious. When man knows his own powers and the workings of his mind, his great desire is to find an easy and quick way to impress the subconscious with good, for mere intellectual knowledge of truth will not bring results. In my own case, I found that the easiest way is to cast the burden. A metaphysician once explained it this way. He said, the only thing that gives weight to anything in nature is the law of gravitation. And if a boulder could be carried to the top of the planet, there would be no weight on that boulder. And that is what Jesus Christ meant when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He had overcome the vibration of the world and functioned in the realm of the fourth dimension, where there is only perfection, completion, life and joy. He said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We are also told in Psalm 55, Cast your burden upon the Lord. Many passages in the Bible state that the battle is God's, not man's, and that man must always stand still and see the Lord's salvation. This indicates that the superconscious mind, or Christ within, is the department that wages man's battle and delivers him from the burdens. We see then that man violates the law if he carries a burden. And a burden is an adverse thought or condition, and this thought or condition has its root in the subconscious. It seems almost impossible to advance by directing the subconscious from the conscious or reasoning mind, for the reasoning mind, the intellect, is limited in its conceptions and full of doubts and fears. How scientific it is then to cast the burden upon the superconscious mind or inner Christ, where it makes light or dissolves into its native nothingness. For example, a woman who has an urgent need for money makes light upon the inner Christ, the superconscious, with the affirmation, I cast this burden of lack upon the inner Christ and free myself to have abundance. The belief in lack was his burden, and by casting it upon the superconscious with his belief in abundance, the result was an avalanche of supply. We read, Christ in you the hope of glory. Another example, one of my students had been given a new piano and there was no room in her studio for it until she had moved the old one. She was in a state of perplexity. She wanted to keep the old piano, but did not know where to send it. 
He despaired as the new piano was to be shipped immediately. In fact, it was on its way with no place to put it. He said it occurred to him to repeat, I cast this burden upon the Christ within, and I am set free. A few moments later her phone rang and a friend asked if she could rent her old piano, and she moved it a few minutes before the new one arrived. I met a woman whose burden was resentment. She said, I throw this burden of resentment to the Christ within and free myself, to be loving, harmonious and happy. The Almighty Superconscious flooded the subconscious with love, and her whole life changed. For years, resentment had kept her in a state of torment and imprisoned her soul, the subconscious mind. The affirmation must be done over and over again, sometimes for hours, silently or audibly, quietly, but with determination. I have often compared it to winding up a Victrola. We must wind ourselves up with spoken words. I have noticed that by winding up, after a while, one seems to see clearly. It is impossible to have a clear vision while in the throes of the carnal mind. Doubts and fear poison the mind and body, and the imagination runs wild, attracting disaster and disease. By constantly repeating the affirmation, I cast this burden to the Christ within and free myself, the vision clears, and with it a feeling of relief. And sooner or later the manifestation of good, whether health, happiness or supply, arrives. One of my students once asked me to explain the darkness before the dawn. I referred in a previous chapter to the fact that often, before the great manifestation, everything seems to go wrong, and a deep depression clouds the consciousness. It means that from the subconscious the usual doubts and fears arise. These old subconscious abandonments rise to the surface to be extinguished. It is then that man should clap his symbols, like Jehoshaphat, and give thanks that he has been saved, even though he seems to be surrounded by the enemy, the situation of lack or disease. The student continued, How long should one remain in the dark? And I replied, Until one can see in the dark, and casting the burden allows one to see in the dark. To impress the subconscious, active faith is always essential. Faith without works is dead. In these chapters, I have endeavored to bring out this point. Jesus Christ showed active faith when he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, before giving thanks for the loaves and fishes. I will give another example that shows how necessary this step is. In fact, active faith is the bridge over which man passes to his promised land. Because of a misunderstanding, a woman had separated from her husband, whom she loved deeply. He refused all offers of reconciliation and would not communicate with her in any way. Coming to the knowledge of the spiritual law, she denied the appearance of separation. She made this statement, There is no separation in the divine mind. Therefore, I cannot be separated from the love and companionship that are mine by divine right. She demonstrated active faith by arranging a place for him at the table every day, thus impressing the subconscious with an image of his return. More than a year passed, but she never wavered, and one day he came in. The subconscious is often impressed through music. Music has a fourth-dimensional quality and frees the soul from its confinement. It makes wonderful things seem possible and easy to do. I have a friend who uses her Victrola daily for this purpose. It puts her in perfect harmony and frees the imagination. Another woman often dances while doing her affirmations. The rhythm and harmony of music and movement carry her words with tremendous power. The student must remember, too, not to despise the day of small things. Invariably, before a manifestation, come signs of land. Before Columbus came to America, he saw birds and twigs that told him that land was near. The same is true of a demonstration, but often the student mistakes it for the demonstration itself and is disappointed. For example, a woman had said the word for a dinner service. Shortly afterwards, a friend gave her an old cracked crockery. She came to me and said, Well, I asked for dinnerware and all I got was a cracked plate. I replied, The plate just had signs of dirt on it. That shows that your dishes are coming. Look at it like birds and seaweed. And it didn't take long for the dishes to arrive. Continuous make-believe impresses the subconscious. If one makes believe that he is rich and makes believe that he is successful, in due time he will reap. Children are always make-believe. And except ye be converted and become as little children, 
ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. For example, I know of a woman who was very poor, but no one could make her feel poor. She earned a small amount of money thanks to some rich friends, who constantly reminded her of her poverty and to be careful and save. In spite of their warnings, she would spend all she earned on a hat or give a gift to someone, and was in an exultant mood. Her thoughts were always on nice clothes and rings and things, but without envying others. She lived in the world of the wonderful, and only riches seemed real to her. Before long she married a rich man, and the rings and things became visible. I don't know if the man was the divine selection, but opulence had to manifest itself in her life, as she had only imagined opulence. There is no peace or happiness for man, until he has erased all fear from the subconscious. Fear is a misdirected energy and must be redirected or transmuted into faith. Jesus Christ said, Why are you afraid, O ye of little faith? All things are possible to him who believes. I am asked very often by my students, How can I get rid of fear? I answer, By approaching that which makes you afraid. The lion takes its fierceness from your fear. Approach the lion and it will disappear. Run away and it will run after you. I have shown in previous chapters how the lion of lack disappeared when the individual spent money without fear, showing faith that God was his supply and therefore infallible. Many of my students have come out of the bondage of poverty and are now abundantly supplied, having lost all fear of letting money out. The subconscious is impressed with the truth that God is the giver and the gift. Therefore, as one is one with the giver, one is one with the gift. A splendid statement is, now I thank God the giver for God the gift. Man has so long separated himself from his good and his supply through thoughts of separation and lack that sometimes it takes dynamite to dislodge these false ideas from the subconscious. And dynamite is a great situation. We see in the illustration above how the individual freed himself from his bondage by showing fearlessness. Man must watch himself hourly to detect whether his motive for action is fear or faith. Choose you this day whom we will serve, fear or faith. Perhaps one's fear is of the personality. Then one should not avoid the feared persons. One should be willing to meet them cheerfully, and they will prove to be golden links in the chain of our good, or they will harmoniously disappear from our path. Perhaps the fear is of disease or germs. In that case, one should be without fear and discomfort in a germ-laden situation, and one would be immune. One can only get germs while vibrating at the same rate as the germ, and fear drags man down to the level of the germ. Of course, the disease-laden germ is the product of the carnal mind as all thought must objectify. Germs do not exist in the superconscious or divine mind, therefore they are the product of man's vain imagination. In the twinkling of an eye, man's liberation will come when he realizes that there is no power in evil. The material world will vanish, and the world of the fourth dimension, the world of the wonderful, will come into manifestation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Chapter 7. Love. All men on this planet are initiated into love. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Uspensky states, in Tertium Organum, that love is a cosmic phenomenon and opens to man the world of the fourth dimension, the world of the marvelous. True love is selfless and free from fear. It pours itself out on the object of its affection, demanding nothing in return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure and unselfish love attracts its own. It need not seek or demand. Hardly anyone has the slightest idea of true love. Man is selfish, tyrannical or fearful in his affections, thus losing what he loves. Jealousy is the worst enemy of love, for the imagination runs wild at seeing the loved one attracted to another, and invariably these fears are objectified if not neutralized. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. The man she loved had left her for other women and she said he had never intended to marry her, she was torn with jealousy and resentment and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer, and she added, How could he leave me when I loved him so much? I replied, You are not loving that man, you are hating him. 
and added, You can never receive what you have never given. Give perfect love, and you will receive perfect love. Perfect this man. Give him perfect selfless love without demanding anything in return. Don't criticize or condemn, and bless him wherever he is. She replied, No, I won't bless him if I don't know where he is. Well, I said, that's not real love. When you send real love, real love will come back to you, either from this man or his equivalent, because if this man is not the divine selection, you will not want him. As you are one with God, you are one with the love that belongs to you by divine right. Several months passed, and things remained more or less the same, but she was working conscientiously with herself. I told her, when you are no longer bothered by his cruelty, he will cease to be cruel, for you are attracting him through your own emotions. Then I told her about a brotherhood in India, who never said good morning to each other. They used these words, I salute the divinity in you. They saluted the divinity in every man, and in the wild animals in the jungle, and they never harmed them, because they saw only God in every living being. I said, greet the divinity in this man, and say, I see only your divine being. I see you as God sees you perfect, made in his image and likeness. She found that she was becoming more balanced and gradually losing her resentment. He was a captain, and she always called him El Capi. One day she suddenly said, God bless El Capi wherever he is. I replied, that's real love, and when you have become full circle and no longer bothered by the situation, you will have his love or attract his equivalent. At the time I was moving and had no phone, so I was out of contact with her for a few weeks, when one morning I received a letter that said, We are married. As soon as I could, I called her. My first words to her were, What happened? Oh, she exclaimed, a miracle. One day I woke up and all suffering had ceased. I saw him that night and he asked me to marry him. We were married within a week, and I have never seen a more devoted man. There is an old saying, no man is your enemy, no man is your friend, all men are your teachers. So one must become impersonal and learn what every man has to teach him, and soon he will learn his lessons and be free. The woman's lover was teaching him selfless love which every man sooner or later must learn. Suffering is not necessary for man's development. It is the result of the violation of spiritual law, but few people seem able to awaken from their soul sleep without it. When people are happy, they generally become selfish, and automatically the law of karma is put into action. Man often suffers losses due to lack of appreciation. I knew a woman who had a very nice husband, but she often said, I am not at all interested in being married, but that is nothing against my husband. I just don't care about married life. She had other interests and hardly remembered that she had a husband. She only thought of him when she saw him. One day her husband told her he was in love with another woman and left. She came to me distressed and resentful. I replied, that's exactly what you said the word. You said you didn't care anything about being married, so the subconscious worked to keep you from getting married. She said, oh yes, I see. People get what they want and then feel very hurt. She soon became perfectly attuned to the situation and knew that the two of them were much happier apart. When a woman becomes indifferent or critical and ceases to be an inspiration to her husband, he misses the stimulation of his first relationship and becomes restless and unhappy. A man came to me dejected, miserable and poor. His wife was interested in the science of numbers and had made him read. It seems the report was not very favorable for he said, my wife says I will never amount to anything because I am a deuce. I replied, I don't care what your number is, you are a perfect idea in the divine mind and we will demand the success and prosperity already planned for you by that infinite intelligence. Within a few weeks he had a very good position, and a year or two later he achieved brilliant success as a writer. No man succeeds in business unless he loves his work. The picture which the artist paints for love, of his art, is his best work. The boiler is always something to live for. No man can attract money if he despises it. Many people keep themselves in poverty by saying, money means nothing to me and I feel contempt for people who have it. This is the reason why many artists are poor. Their contempt for money separates them from it. I remember hearing one artist say of another, he's no good as an artist, he has money in the bank. 
This mental attitude, of course, separates a man from his supply. He must be in harmony with a thing to attract it. Money is God in its manifestation, as freedom from lack and limitation. But it must always be kept in circulation and put to right uses. Hoarding and saving react with grim vengeance. This does not mean that man should not have houses and lots, stocks and bonds, for the barns of the just shall be full. It means that man should not hoard even capital if an occasion arises when money is needed. By letting it go out fearlessly and joyfully, he opens the way for more to come in, for God is man's unfailing and inexhaustible supply. This is the spiritual attitude toward money, and the great bank of the universal never fails. We see an example of hoarding in the movie production, Greed. The woman won $5,000 in the lottery, but did not want to spend it. She hoarded and saved, let her husband suffer and starve, and finally made a living scrubbing floors. She loved money in itself, and put it above all else, and one night she was murdered and her money was taken from her. This is an example that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money in itself is good and beneficial, but used for destructive purposes, hoarded and kept, or considered more important than love, brings sickness and disaster, and the loss of money itself. Follow the way of love, and all things add up, for God is love, and God is supply. Follow the way of selfishness and greed, and supply disappears, or man separates himself from it. For instance, I knew the case of a very rich woman who hoarded her income. She seldom gave anything away, but bought and bought and bought and bought things for herself. She was very fond of necklaces, and a friend once asked her how many she owned. She replied, 67. She bought them and kept them carefully wrapped in tissue paper. If she had worn the necklaces, it would have been quite legitimate, but she was violating the law of wear. Her closets were full of clothes she never wore, and jewellery that never saw the light of day. The woman's arms were becoming paralysed from clinging so tightly to things, and finally she was deemed incapable of minding her own affairs, and her wealth was given to others to manage. Thus man ignoring the law brings about his own destruction. All disease, all unhappiness, comes from the violation of the law of love. Man's boomerangs of hatred, resentment and criticism return laden with sickness and pain. Love seems almost a lost art, but man with the knowledge of spiritual law knows that it must be recovered, for without it, it has become sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. For example, I had a student who came to me month after month to cleanse her conscience of resentments. After a while, she got to the point where she only resented one woman, but that one woman kept her busy. Gradually, she became more balanced and harmonized, and one day all resentment was erased. She came in beaming and exclaimed, You can't understand how I feel. The woman said something to me, and instead of being furious, I was loving and kind, and she apologized and was perfectly lovely to me. No one can understand the wonderful lightness I feel inside. Love and goodwill are invaluable in business. For example, a woman came to see me, complaining about her employer. She said that she was cold and critical, and that she knew I didn't want her in the position. Well, I replied, say hello to the divine in the woman and send her love. She said, I can't. She is a marble woman. I replied, you remember the story of the sculptor who asked for a certain piece of marble. They asked him why he wanted it, and he replied, because there is an angel in the marble, and from it he produced a wonderful work of art. She said, very well, I will try it. A week later she came back and said, I did what you told me, and now the woman is very kind, and she gave me a ride in her car. Sometimes people are filled with remorse for having done a wrong to someone, perhaps years ago. If the wrong cannot be righted, its effect can be neutralized by doing a kindness to someone in the present. This is what I do. Forget what is behind and extend myself toward what is ahead. Grief, regret, and remorse tear the cells of the body and poison the atmosphere of the individual. One woman said to me in great sorrow, Treat me to be happy and cheerful, because my sorrow makes me so irritable with my family members that I keep making more karma. I was asked to treat a woman who was mourning her daughter. I denied any belief in loss and separation, and affirmed that God was the woman's joy, love, and peace. The woman at once regained her poise, but sent word for her son, 
not to treat her anymore because she was so happy she was not respectable. So the mortal mind loves to cling to its sorrows and regrets. I knew a woman who went around bragging about her problems, so of course she always had something to brag about. The old idea was that if a woman didn't care about her children, she wasn't a good mother. Now we know that maternal fear is responsible for many of the illnesses and accidents that come into the lives of children, for fear vividly imagines the disease or situation feared, and these images objectify if they are not neutralized. Happy is the mother who can sincerely say that she puts her child in the hands of God, and knows therefore that it is divinely protected. For example, a woman woke up suddenly in the night, feeling that her brother was in great danger. Instead of yielding to her fears, she began to make statements of truth, saying, Man is a perfect idea in divine mind, and is always in his right place, therefore my brother is in his right place, and is divinely protected. The next day he discovered that his brother had been very close to an explosion in a mine, but had miraculously escaped. So man is his brother's keeper, in thought, and every man should know that what he loves dwells in the secret place of the Most High, and dwells under the shadow of the Almighty. No evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Perfect love casteth out fear. He who fears is not perfected in love. And love is the fulfillment of the law. Chapter 8. Intuition or Guidance In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Nothing is too great for the man who knows the power of his word, and who follows his intuitive directions. By the word he puts invisible forces into action, and can rebuild his body or remodel his affairs. Therefore it is of the utmost importance to choose the right words, and the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. He knows that God is his supply, that there is a supply for every demand, and that his spoken word releases this supply. Ask, and ye shall receive. Man must take the first step. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I have often been asked how to demonstrate, I answer, speak the word and then do nothing until you have a definite clue. Demand the clue, saying, Infinite Spirit, reveal to me the way, let me know if there is anything I should do. The answer will come through intuition or hunch, a casual remark from someone or a passage from a book, etc., etc., etc. The answers are sometimes surprising in their accuracy. For example, a woman wanted a large sum of money. She uttered the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for my immediate supply, make all that is mine by divine right come to me now in great floods of abundance. Then he added, Give me a definite hint, let me know if there is anything I should do. The thought came quickly. Give a certain friend, who had helped her spiritually, a hundred dollars. She told her friend, who said, Wait and get another clue before you give it to her. So she waited. And that day she met a woman who said, I gave someone a dollar today, it was as much for me as it would be for you to give someone a hundred. This was indeed an unmistakable clue, so he knew he was right to give the hundred dollars. It was a gift that turned out to be a great investment, for shortly thereafter, a large sum of money came to him in an extraordinary way. Giving opens the way to receiving. To create activity in finances, one must give. Tithing or giving a tenth of one's income is an ancient Jewish custom and is sure to bring increase. Many of the wealthiest men in this country have been tithers, and I have never known it to fail as an investment. The tenth goes out and returns blessed and multiplied, but the gift or tithe should be given with love and cheerfulness, for God loves a cheerful giver. Bills should be paid cheerfully. All money should be sent without fear and with a blessing. This attitude of mind makes man the owner of the money. It behooves him to obey, and his word then opens up vast stores of wealth. Man himself limits his supply by his limited vision. Sometimes the student has a great understanding of wealth, but is afraid to act. Vision and action must go hand in hand, as in the case of the man who bought the fur coat. A woman came to me to ask me to say the word for a position. So I asked, Infinite Spirit, open the way for the right position for this woman. Never ask for just a position. Ask for the right position, the place already planned in divine mind, for it is the only one that will give satisfaction. 
Then I gave thanks that she had already received and that she would manifest quickly. Very soon she was offered three positions, two in New York and one in Palm Beach, and she did not know which one to choose. I said, ask for a definite lead. Time had almost passed and he was still undecided, when one day he phoned, when I woke up this morning, I could smell Palm Beach. He had been there before and knew its pleasant fragrance. I replied, well, if you can smell Palm Beach from here, it's certainly your clue. He accepted the position, which turned out to be a great success. Often, one's leadership comes at an unexpected time. One day, I was walking down the street when I suddenly felt a strong impulse to go to a certain bakery a block or two away. The reasoning mind resisted, arguing, there is nothing there that you want. However, I had learned not to reason, so I went to the bakery, looked at everything, and there was certainly nothing there that I wanted. But on my way out I met a woman I had often thought about, and who was in great need of the help I could give her. Often one goes for one thing and finds another. Intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain but simply points the way. Often a person receives a clue during a treatment. The idea that comes may seem quite irrelevant, but some of God's clues are mysterious. In class one day I was trying to get each individual to receive a definite clue. A woman came to me afterwards and said, while you were trying, I had a hunch to get my furniture out of storage and get an apartment. The woman had come to be treated for health. I told her that I knew that by getting a home of her own, her health would improve, and I added, I think your problem, which is congestion, has come from having things in storage. Congestion of things causes congestion in the body. You have violated the law of use, and your body is paying the penalty. So give thanks that divine order was established in your mind, body, and affairs. People dream little of how their affairs react in the body. There is a mental correspondence for every illness. A person could receive instant healing through the realization that his body is a perfect idea in divine mind and, therefore, complete and perfect. But if he continues his destructive thinking, hoarding, hating, fearing, condemning, the disease will return. Jesus Christ knew that all sickness came from sin, but he admonished the leper after the healing, that he should go away and sin no more, lest something worse should befall him. So the soul of man, or subconscious mind, must be washed whiter than snow for permanent healing, and the metaphysician is always digging deep for correspondence. Jesus Christ said, Condemn not, lest ye also be condemned. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Many people have attracted sickness and unhappiness by condemning others. What man condemns in others, he attracts to himself. For example, a friend came to me angry and distressed because her husband had left her for another woman. She condemned the other woman and said continually, She knew he was a married man and had no right to accept her attentions. I replied, Stop condemning the woman, bless her, and end the situation, otherwise you are attracting the same for yourself. She turned a deaf ear to my words, and a year or two later she became deeply interested in a married man, herself. The man catches a live rope every time he criticizes or condemns and can expect a shock. Indecision is a stumbling block in many paths. To overcome it, make the statement repeatedly, I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. These words impress the subconscious and soon one finds himself awake and alert, making his right moves without hesitation. I have found it destructive to seek guidance on the psychic plane for it is the plane of many minds and not of the one mind. As man opens his mind to subjectivity, he becomes a target for destructive forces. The psychic plane is the result of man's mortal thinking and is on the plane of opposites. It can receive good or bad messages. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man on the mental or mortal plane, for they deal only with the karmic path. I know a man who should have died years ago according to his horoscope, but he is alive and is a leader of one of the greatest movements in this country for the upliftment of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, all false prophecy will come to naught. Every plan which my Father in heaven has not planned will dissolve and dissipate. The divine idea is now fulfilled. However, if ever a good message has been given of coming happiness or of wealth, Cherish it and wait for it and it will manifest sooner or later, 
by the law of expectation. The will of man must serve to support the universal will. I will that the will of God be done. God's will is to give to every man all the righteous desires of his heart, and man's will must be used to support the perfect vision without wavering. The prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. Indeed, it is often an effort of the will to leave the husks and swine of mortal thinking. It is much easier for the average person to have fear than faith, so faith is an effort of the will. As man awakens spiritually, he recognizes that any external inharmony is the correspondence of a mental inharmony. If he stumbles or falls, he can know that he is stumbling or falling in consciousness. One day a student was walking down the street, condemning someone in her thoughts. She was mentally saying, that woman is the nastiest woman on earth, when suddenly three Boy Scouts rushed around the corner and almost knocked her down. She did not condemn the Boy Scouts, but immediately invoked the law of forgiveness and saluted the divinity of the woman. The path of wisdom is a pleasant path, and all its ways are of peace. When one has made one's demands upon the universal, one must be prepared for surprises. It may seem that everything is going wrong, when in fact it is going right. For example, a woman was told that there was no loss in the divine mind, therefore she could not lose anything that belonged to her. Anything lost would be returned to her, or she would receive its equivalent. Several years before, she had lost two thousand dollars. She had loaned the money to a relative during her lifetime, but he had died, leaving no record of it in his will. The woman was resentful and angry, and since she had no written statement of the transaction, she never received the money. So she decided to deny the loss and collect the two thousand dollars from the Universal Bank. She had to start by forgiving the woman, since resentment and unforgiveness closed the doors of this wonderful bank. She made this statement, I deny the loss. There is no loss in the divine mind. Therefore, I cannot lose the two thousand dollars, which belongs to me by divine right. When one door closes, another opens. I lived in an apartment house that was for sale, and in the lease there was a clause that if the house was sold, the tenants must move out within ninety days. Suddenly the landlord broke the lease and raised the rent. Again, injustice crossed his path, but this time he was undeterred. She blessed the landlord and said, Since the rent has gone up it means that I will be much richer, for God is my provider. New leases were made for the advance rent, but by some divine mistake the ninety-day clause had been forgotten. Shortly thereafter, the owner had the opportunity to sell the house. Because of the error in the new leases, the tenants retained possession for another year. The agent offered each tenant $200 if they would vacate. Several families moved out, three stayed including the woman. A month or two passed and the agent appeared again. This time he said to the woman, Would you like to break the lease for the sum of $1,500? She thought, Here comes the $2,000. She remembered saying to her friends at the house, We'll all act together if anything more is said about leaving. So her clue was to consult her friends. These friends said, Well, if you've been offered fifteen hundred, you're sure to get two thousand. So she received a check for two thousand dollars for leaving the apartment. It was certainly a remarkable operation of the law, and the apparent injustice merely opened the way for his demonstration. He showed that there is no loss, and that when man takes his spiritual stand, he gathers all that is his from this great repository of good. I will repay thee the years that the locusts have eaten. The locusts are the doubts, fears, resentments, and regrets of mortal thought. These adverse thoughts alone rob man, for no man giveth to himself but himself, and no man taketh from himself but himself. Man is here to prove God and bear witness to the truth and he can only prove God by bringing abundance out of want, and righteousness out of unrighteousness. Prove me now by this, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open unto thee the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Chapter 9. Perfect Self-Expression or Divine Design No wind can turn aside my boat, nor turn the tide of destiny. There is for every man perfect self-expression. There is a place he must fill that no one else can fill, something he must do that no one else can do. 
It is his destiny. This achievement stands a perfect idea in the divine mind, awaiting man's recognition. As the faculty of imagining is the creative faculty, it is necessary for man to see the idea before it can manifest. Thus man's highest demand is the divine design of his life. He may not have the slightest idea of what it is, for possibly there is some marvelous talent hidden deep within him. His demand should be, Infinite Spirit, open the way for the divine design of my life to manifest. Let the genius in me be released now, let me see clearly the perfect plan. The perfect plan includes health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. This is the square of life which brings perfect happiness. When one has made this demand, he may find that great changes take place in his life, for almost all men have turned away from the divine design. I know that, in the case of one woman, it was as if a cyclone had struck her affairs, but readjustments came quickly, and new and wonderful conditions took the place of the old. Perfect self-expression will never be work, but of such absorbing interest that it will seem almost a game. The student knows, moreover, that when man comes into the world financed by God, the supply necessary for his perfect self-expression will be at hand. Many a genius has struggled for years with the problem of supply when his word and faith would have quickly released the necessary funds. For example, after class one day, a man came to me and gave me a penny. He said to me, I have only seven cents in the world, and I am going to give you one. Because I have faith in the power of your spoken word, I want you to utter the word for my perfect self-expression and prosperity. I spoke the word, and did not see him again until a year later. He came in one day successful and happy, with a roll of yellow bills in his pocket. He said, Immediately after you uttered the word, I was offered a position in a distant city, and now I am demonstrating health, happiness, and supply. A woman's perfect self-expression may be in becoming a perfect wife, a perfect mother, a perfect homemaker, and not necessarily in having a public career. Demand definite attracts, and the path will become easy and successful. One should not visualize or force a mental image. When you demand that divine design enter your conscious mind, you will receive flashes of inspiration, and you will begin to see yourself accomplishing some great achievement. This is the image or idea which he must hold without hesitation. What man seeks, seeks him. The telephone sought bell. Parents should never force careers and professions upon their children. With a knowledge of spiritual truth, the divine plan could be spoken of from infancy or prenatally. A prenatal treatment should be, may the God in this child have perfect expression, may the divine design of his mind, body and affairs be manifested throughout his life, throughout eternity. Let God's will be done, not man's will. God's pattern, not man's, is the command we find throughout the scriptures, and the Bible is a book that deals with the science of mind. It is a book that tells man how to free his soul, or subconscious mind, from bondage. The battles described are pictures of man waging war against mortal thoughts. Man's enemies will be those of his own household. Every man is Jehoshaphat, and every man is David, who slays Goliath, mortal thought, with the little white stone, faith. So man must be careful not to be the wicked and slothful servant who buried his talent. There is a terrible penalty to be paid for not using one's ability. Often fear stands between man and his perfect expression. Stage fright has hindered many a genius. This can be overcome by the spoken word or treatment. The individual then loses all self-consciousness and feels simply that he is a channel for infinite intelligence to express itself through him. He is under direct inspiration, fearlessly and confidently, because he feels that it is the Father within who does the work. A young man often came to my class with his mother. He asked me to say the word for his upcoming exams at school. I told him to make the statement, I am one with infinite intelligence. I know everything I need to know about this subject. He had an excellent knowledge of history, but he was not sure about arithmetic. I saw him afterwards and he said, I said the word for my arithmetic and passed with highest honors, but I thought I could depend upon myself for history and got a very poor grade. Man usually receives a setback when he is too sure of himself, meaning that he relies on his personality and not on the father within. Another of my students gave me an example of this. One summer she went on a long trip abroad, 
visiting many countries where she did not know the languages. She asked for guidance and protection every minute, and her affairs went smoothly and miraculously. Her luggage was never delayed or lost. Accommodations were always ready for her in the best hotels, and she had perfect service wherever she went. She returned to New York. Knowing the language, she felt that God was no longer needed, so she went about her business in the ordinary way. Everything went wrong. His trunks were late, amidst in harmony and confusion. The student must form the habit of practicing the presence of God every minute. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Nothing is too small or too great. Sometimes an insignificant incident can be the turning point in a man's life. Robert Fulton, watching some boiling water in a kettle, saw a steamboat. I have seen a student, often, withholding his demonstration through resistance or pointing the way. He fixes his faith in a single channel and dictates just the way he wishes the manifestation to come, which brings things to a standstill. My way, not yours, is the command of infinite intelligence. Like all power, whether steam or electricity, it must have a non-resistant engine or instrument to work, and man is that engine or instrument. Again and again man is told to be still. O Judah, fear not, but tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Ye shall have no need to fight this battle. Stand ye still, be still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. We see this in the incidents of the two thousand dollars that came to the woman through the landlord when she became non-resistant and unperturbed, and the woman winning the man's love after all suffering had ceased. The goal of the student is poise. Poise is power, because it gives God power the opportunity to hasten through man, to will and do his good pleasure. Aplomado, he thinks clearly, and makes quickly the right decisions. He never misses a trick. Anger clouds the visions, poisons the blood, is the root of many diseases, and causes wrong decisions that lead to failure. It has been called one of the worst sins, as its reaction is very harmful. The student learns that in metaphysics, sin has a much broader meaning than in the ancient teaching. Everything that is not of faith is sin. He discovers that fear and worry are deadly sins. They are faith reversed, and through distorted mental images, they cause what he fears to happen. His work is to expel these enemies from the subconscious mind. When man is not afraid he is finished, says Maeterlinck, that man is God-fearing. So, as we have read in the previous chapters, man can only overcome fear by approaching that which he fears. When Jehoshaphat and his army prepared to meet the enemy, singing praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever, they found that their enemies had destroyed each other and there was nothing to fight. For example, a woman asked a friend to deliver a message to another friend. The woman was afraid to give the message for the reasoning mind said, keep out of this matter, do not give that message. She was troubled in spirit, for she had given her promise. At last, she decided to approach the lion and invoke the law of divine protection. She met the friend to whom she was to deliver the message. She opened her mouth to say it when her friend said, so-and-so has left town. This made it unnecessary to give the message, as the situation depended on the person being in town. Since she was willing to do so, she was not obliged. Since she was not afraid, the situation vanished. The student often delays his demonstration because of the belief that it is incomplete. He should make this statement, In the divine mind there is only completeness, therefore my demonstration is complete, my work perfect, my home perfect, my health perfect. All that he demands are perfect ideas recorded in the divine mind, and they must manifest under grace in a perfect manner. He is grateful that he has already received in the invisible and actively prepares to receive in the visible. One of my students needed a financial demonstration. He came to see me and asked why it was not finished. I replied, perhaps you have a habit of leaving things unfinished, and the subconscious has become accustomed to not completing, as the outer, so the inner. She said, you are right. I often start things and never finish them. I go home and finish something I started weeks ago, and I know it will be a symbol of my demonstration. So she sewed assiduously, and the item was soon finished. Soon after, the money came in a most curious way. Her husband collected his paycheck twice that month. He told the people of his mistake, and they sent him to keep the money. 
When man asks believing, he must receive, for God creates his own channels. I have sometimes been asked, suppose one has several talents, how is he to know which to choose? Demand to be shown definitely. Say, infinite spirit, give me a definite clue, reveal to me my perfect self-expression. Show me which talent I should now make use of. I have known people suddenly enter a new line of work, and they are fully equipped with little or no training. So make the affirmation, I am fully equipped for the divine plan for my life, and don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities. Some people are cheerful givers, but poor receivers. They refuse gifts out of pride, or for some negative reason, thus blocking their channels and invariably find themselves eventually with little or nothing. For example, a woman who had given away a lot of money was offered a gift of several thousand dollars. She refused to accept it, saying she didn't need it. Shortly thereafter her finances became tied up, and she found herself in debt for that amount. Man should graciously receive the bread that is returned to him over the water. Freely ye have given, freely ye shall receive. There is always a perfect balance between giving and receiving, and although man should give without thought of returns, he violates the law if he does not accept the returns that come to him. For all gifts are from God, man being merely the channel. A thought of lack should never be held over the giver. E.g. when the man gave me a penny I did not say, poor man he cannot afford to give me that. I saw him rich and prosperous with his supply in abundance. It was this thought that brought it. If one has been a bad receiver, he must become a good one and take even a postage stamp if given, and open his channels to receive. The Lord loves a cheerful receiver as well as a cheerful giver. I have often been asked why one man is born rich and healthy, and another poor and sick. Where there is an effect, there is always a cause, there is no such thing as chance. This question is answered by the law of reincarnation. Man passes through many births and deaths until he knows the truth that sets him free. He is drawn back to the earth plane by unfulfilled desire to pay his karmic debts or to fulfill his destiny. The man who is born rich and healthy has had images in his subconscious mind, in his past life, of health and wealth, and the poor and sick man of sickness and poverty. Man manifests on whatever plane the sum total of his subconscious beliefs. However, birth and death are man-made laws, for the wages of sin is death, the Adamic fall in consciousness by belief in two powers. The real man, the spiritual man, has neither birth nor death. He has never been born and never did, as he was in the beginning, now is, and ever shall be. So through truth, man is freed from the law of karma, from sin and death, and manifests man made in his image and likeness. Man's freedom comes through the fulfillment of his destiny, bringing into manifestation the divine design of his life. His Lord will say to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things, death itself. Enter into the joy of your Lord, eternal life. Chapter 10. Negations and Affirmations Thou shalt also decree one thing, and it shall be established unto thee. All the good that is to be manifested in the life of man is already a fait accompli in the divine mind, and is released through man's recognition or spoken word, so he must be careful to decree that only the divine idea be manifested, for often he decrees through his idle words, failure, or misfortune. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance to word one's demands correctly, as stated in a previous chapter. If one desires a home, a friend, a position, or any other good thing, make the demand by divine selection. For example, infinite spirit, open the way for my right home, my right friend, my right position. I give thanks that it now manifests under grace in a perfect way. The last part of the statement is the most important. For example, I knew a woman who demanded a thousand dollars. Her daughter was injured, and they received a thousand dollar settlement so it was not manifested in a perfect manner. The demand should have been worded like this, Infinite Spirit, I give thanks that the thousand dollars, which is mine by divine right, is now released, and comes to me under grace in a perfect manner. As one grows in financial consciousness, he must demand that the enormous sums of money, which are his by divine right, come to him under grace in a perfect manner. 
It is impossible for man to release more than he thinks is possible, because one is bound by the limited expectations of the subconscious. He must broaden his expectations in order to receive more widely. Man often limits himself in his demands. For example, a student demanded $600 by a certain date. He received it, but heard later that he came very close to receiving $1,000, but was given only $600 as a result of his word. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Wealth is a matter of conscience. The French have a legend that gives an example of this. A poor man was walking along a road when he met a traveler who stopped him and said, My good friend, I see that you are poor. Take this nugget of gold, sell it, and you will be rich all your days. The man rejoiced at his good fortune and took the nugget home. He immediately found work and became so prosperous that he did not sell the nugget. Years passed and he became a very rich man. One day he met a poor man on the road. He stopped him and said, My good friend, I will give you this nugget of gold, which, if you sell it, will make you rich for life. The beggar took the nugget, had it appraised, and discovered that it was only brass. As we see, the first man became rich by feeling rich, thinking that the nugget was gold. Every man has within him a nugget of gold. It is his consciousness of gold of opulence that brings wealth into his life. In making his demands, man begins at the end of his journey. That is, he declares that he has already received. Before you call, I will answer you. Continually affirming establishes belief in the subconscious. It would not be necessary to make an affirmation more than once if one had perfect faith. One should not plead or beg, but give thanks repeatedly that he has received. The wilderness shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. This rejoicing that is still in the desert state of consciousness, opens the way for liberation. The Lord's Prayer takes the form of a command and demand, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and ends in praise, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As for the works of my hands, command me. So prayer is command and demand, praise and thanksgiving. The student's job is to make himself believe that with God, all things are possible. This is easy enough to state in the abstract, but a bit more difficult when faced with a problem. For example, a woman needed to demonstrate a large sum of money by a certain deadline. She knew she had to do something to get a realization, for realization is manifestation, and she demanded a clue. She was strolling through a department store when she saw a beautiful pink enamel paper cutter. He felt the attraction to it. The thought came to him. I don't have a paper cutter good enough to open letters containing large checks. So he bought the paper cutter, which the reasoning mind would have called an extravagance. When she held it in her hand, she had a flash of an image of herself opening an envelope containing a large check, and within a few weeks she received the money. The pink paper cutter was her bridge of active faith. Many stories are told about the power of the subconscious when directed with faith. For example, a man was spending the night on a farm. The windows in the room had been nailed shut, and in the middle of the night he felt suffocated and walked in the dark to the window. He couldn't open it, so he smashed the glass with his fist, sucked in breaths of fresh air, and had a wonderful night. The next morning, he discovered that he had broken the glass of a bookcase and that the window had remained closed all night. He had supplied himself with oxygen, simply by his thought of oxygen. When a student begins to demonstrate, he must never back down. Let not the man who wavers think that he will receive anything from the Lord. A student once made this wonderful statement. When I ask the Father for anything, I put my foot down and say, Father, I will not take anything less than I have asked for, but more. So man must never compromise. Having done all, stand firm. This is sometimes the most difficult moment to demonstrate. There comes the temptation to give up, to back down, to compromise. He also serves who only stands and waits. Demonstrations usually come at the last moment, because then man lets himself go, that is, stops reasoning, and infinite intelligence has a chance to work. Man's mournful desires are mournfully answered, and his impatient desires long delayed or violently fulfilled. E.g. A woman asked me why she was constantly losing or breaking her glasses. We discovered that she often said to herself and others with vexation, I wish I could get rid of my glasses, 
so her impatient wish was violently satisfied. What she should have demanded was perfect eyesight, but what registered in the subconscious was simply the impatient desire to get rid of her glasses, so they were continually broken or lost. There are two mental attitudes that cause loss, depreciation, as in the case of the woman who did not appreciate her husband, or fear of loss, which creates an image of loss in the subconscious. When a student is able to let go of his problem, cast his burden, he will have an instant manifestation. For example, a woman was outside during a very stormy day, and her umbrella blew inside. She was about to pay a visit to some people she didn't know, and didn't want to make her first appearance with a damaged umbrella. She couldn't throw it away, as it didn't belong to her. So, in desperation, she exclaimed, Oh God, take care of this umbrella, I don't know what to do. A moment later, a voice behind her said, Madam, do you want your umbrella mended? There stood an umbrella mender. She replied, Yes, I do. The man mended the umbrella, while she went into the house to make her call, and when she returned, she had a good umbrella. So there is always an umbrella repairman at hand, in the man's path, when one puts the umbrella, or the situation, in God's hands. One should always follow a negation with an affirmation, for example, one night I was called on the phone to attend to a man I had never seen before. Apparently, he was very ill. I made the affirmation, I deny this appearance of illness. It is unreal, therefore it cannot register in your consciousness. This man is a perfect idea in the divine mind, pure substance expressing perfection. There is no time or space in the divine mind, therefore the word arrives instantaneously at its destination and does not return empty. I have treated patients in Europe and have found that the result was instantaneous. I am very often asked the difference between visualizing and visioning. Visualizing is a mental process governed by reasoning or the conscious mind. Visioning is a spiritual process governed by intuition or the superconscious mind. The student must train his mind to receive these flashes of inspiration and work out the divine images through definite clues. When a man can say, I desire only what God desires for me, his false desires fade from consciousness and a new set of blueprints is given to him by the master architect, the God within. God's plan for every man transcends the limitation of the reasoning mind and is always the square of life, containing health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. Many men are building for themselves in imagination a bungalow when they should be building a palace. If a student tries to force a demonstration through the reasoning mind, he brings it to a standstill. I will speed it up, says the Lord. He must act only through intuition or definite clues. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. Trust Him also, and He will do it. I have seen the law act in the most surprising ways. For example, one student stated that it was necessary for her to have $100 by the next day. This was a vitally important debt that needed to be satisfied. I said the word, declaring that the spirit was never too late and that the supply was at hand. That night, he called me on the phone to tell me about the miracle. He said it occurred to him to go to his safe deposit box at the bank to examine some papers. She looked at the papers, and at the bottom of the box was a brand new hundred dollar bill. She was amazed and said she knew she had never put it there because she had gone through the papers many times. It may have been a materialization, just as Jesus Christ materialized the loaves and fishes. Man will reach the stage where his word becomes flesh or materializes instantly. The fields, ripe with harvest, will manifest immediately, as in all the miracles of Jesus Christ. There is tremendous power in the name of Jesus Christ alone. It signifies truth manifested. He said, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. The power of this name lifts the student into the fourth dimension, where he is freed from all astral and psychic influences, and becomes unconditional and absolute, as God himself is unconditional and absolute. I have seen many healings performed using the words, in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ was both person and principle, and the Christ within each man is his Redeemer and salvation. The Christ within is his own fourth dimensional self, the man made in the image and likeness of God. This is the self that has never failed, never known sickness or pain, never been born and never died. 
it is the resurrection and the life of every man. No man cometh unto the Father but by the Son, means that God, the universal, working in the place of the particular, becomes the Christ in man, and the Holy Spirit means God action. Thus daily man is manifesting the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Man must make an art of thought. The master thinker is an artist, and is careful to paint only the divine designs upon the canvas of his mind, and he paints these pictures with masterly strokes of power and decision, having perfect faith that there is no power to mar their perfection, and that they will manifest in his life the ideal come true. All power is given to man through right thinking, to bring his heaven to his earth, and this is the goal of the game of life. The simple rules are fearless faith, non-resistance, and love. Let each reader now free himself from that which has held him in bondage through the ages, standing between him and his, and know the truth that sets him free, free to fulfill his destiny, to bring into manifestation the divine design of his life, health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. Transform yourselves by the renewal of your mind for prosperity. God is my unfailing supply, and large sums of money come to me quickly, under grace, in a perfect manner, for right conditions. Every plan which my Father in heaven has not planned will be dissolved and dissipated, and the divine idea now comes to pass, for right conditions. Only what is true of God is true of me, for I and the Father are one, for faith. As I am one with God, I am one with my good, for God is both the giver and the gift. I cannot separate the giver from the gift, for right conditions. Divine love now dissolves and dispels every wrong condition in my mind, body and affairs. Divine love is the most powerful chemical in the universe and dissolves all that is not of itself. For health, divine love floods my consciousness with health and every cell of my body is filled with light. For sight, my eyes are the eyes of God. I see with the eyes of the Spirit. I see clearly the open path. There are no obstacles in my way. I see clearly the perfect plan. For guidance, I am divinely sensitive to my intuitive guides, and I give instant obedience to your will. For hearing, my ears are the ears of God. I hear with the ears of the Spirit. I do not resist and am willing to be guided. I hear the good news of great joy. For right work, I have a perfect work in a perfect way. I render a perfect service for a perfect pay, for freedom from all bondage. I cast this burden upon the Christ within, and I am set free. As you conclude this transformative journey through the game of life and how to play it, may you carry its timeless wisdom in your heart and apply its principles to create a life filled with abundance, joy, and fulfillment. Remember, you hold the power to shape your destiny with every thought and action. Thank you for joining us on this empowering voyage of self-discovery, wishing you all the success and happiness that you deserve. Farewell, and may your journey ahead be filled with infinite possibilities.